we're back exploring the anatomy of the narrative on Beyond the Paradox, understanding why the way we talk about the world shapes the kind of future we create. An important aspect of the future to include in these discussions is artificial intelligence. Its potential is unexplored, and in fact, it's not quite what movies make us believe. This episode focuses on the common misconceptions around AI and how important it is to be aware of them from an existential and moral perspective. Former BBC filmmaker David Malone talks about his documentary and the risks of losing our humanity if we don't wrestle our understandings of the field from the clutches of the Hollywood post-apocalyptic narrative. David, when I asked which actors would play you in your life's biopic, younger and adult versions of yourself. You gave me some interesting choices. Let's look at the point on the timeline where it's the 80s, and please correct me if I'm wrong at any point. Your dad moves your family to Hollywood to work on Cosmos, the Cosmos series of Carl Sagan. Yeah. And, <laughs> right, so are you broody and introverted like Ethan Hawke in Dead Poets Society at the time? Uh, I was much more so when I was younger, yeah, and then that slowly morphed into the next actor, but yes, I I, I was rather earnest as a young man. So your time there plays a strong role in your decision to follow in your dad's footsteps as a filmmaker, right? No, no, funnily enough, I can honestly say that until the moment I found myself working at the BBC, I had genuinely not given second thought to working in film or television. I had no interest. Um, It had never occurred to me, ever. Once I started working at the BBC, the major, major change it had for me is I found it much more difficult to believe in free will because I realized that it's all fate. The far side of the universe, that a great adamantine time wheel slowly grinding out one's fate because it was the only explanation of how hell I could have ended up at the BBC. Because I fell into it backwards. I mean, uh, everyone, well, not everyone, but lots of people of my generation wanted to work at the BBC. It was one of those jobs, you know, in, in the BBC in film. Um, and I, I didn't. So, <laughs> so, as you said, you, I mean, you did a lot of work for the BBC after that time. I mean, over 20 yeah. documentaries since... I guess over 40 now. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I found online in the list. So there was only 20 there. And they were obviously mostly the same theme. So when I asked you, interestingly enough, who would play adult David, you Mm -hmm. said Joseph Frank Keaton. He's better known as Buster Keaton. At which stage do we go from Ethan Hawke to Keaton? And and just quickly for younger listeners, he's best known for his silent films. At six, he was doing vaudeville acts with his parents on stage. And his father, Joe Keaton, owned a traveling show with Harry (laughs) Houdini. I felt Buster Keaton would be the right person um, to play m- me in my adult life because um, Buster's character always tragically out of step with a world he doesn't really understand. And that's me. That's profound. We're going to unpack that a bit later because he was best known for his, I think his 1926 silent movie, The General. And though it became, it would become to be regarded as his greatest achievement, I think the viewers questioned his judgment in making a comedic film about the Civil War, except for Orson mm. Welles, who loved it, but that's another conversation. There's another parallel that I see with Keaton, though, when I think about it, when he signed with, with MGM, I think, in 28. It's a business decision he said he'd regret, and he realized mm. late that the studio system MGM represented would severely limit his creative input. So from a documentary filmmaker's perspective, what is your thought on mm. that? Well, it's sadly still true. Um, I, the way I see my um, filmmaking efforts, and of course, it's you know, it's just the story I tell myself. So, it, it, but I've always regarded it as a sort of an exercise in guerrilla warfare. In that, I'm asked to do something, or I have the opportunity to do something, and I'm always wanting to do something slightly different from what I'm asked. And so the trick has always been to make a film which, in terms of the letter of the law, does deliver what I was asked to do, what I said I would do, but also manages to tell tell the story I want to tell. I was wondering at what point you were then prompted to author your book, The Debt Generation, because we spoke of the movie 
with Christian Bale and Brad Pitt based on the, the I think the 2010 book, The Big Short, Inside the Doomsday mm-hmm. Machine. And that showed the financial crisis between 2007 and 8 and how it was triggered by the US housing bubble. Yeah. Well, what triggered me to write it is I, I was making a film. Um, I think I started it in 2006. Um, uh, it ended up call, being called um, High Anxieties, The Mathematics of Chaos, which is a terrible title, but it wasn't my choice. Um, and basically in the film, I said, we are in the midst of... Yeah, I mean, the title. I said to them when they said, when they said that's the title, I said, um, you know, is anyone else thinking of Blazing Saddles and <laughs> High Anxiety? That was the name of one of his films. And, and, and you laugh, you, you're giggling, but the ex- television execs I said that to looked at me with stony faces, and I thought, that's okay, true. I am the only one. It's just me and Mel Brooks, never mind. But in that film, I said very clearly, we are in the midst of a crisis of the financial environment, which is about to break. And, you know, I made this film and they weren't really sure what the film was going to be about because I hadn't really told them. And um, I delivered it to them and they were slightly horrified and they put it on the shelf. And finally, they put the film out the day after Lehman Brothers collapsed. So it was very clear to me that this was going to happen. And Mm -hmm. uh, after that, I just started writing um, comments online underneath the articles in the Guardian getting more and more outraged and annoyed and eventually a colleague of mine said you know you've written 180,000 words like this and I said no no I, I knew I was annoyed but no I was that annoyed uh, and uh, so he um, local Mark Tanner said can I edit it into a book uh, I said are you sure you really want to do that but he did so he deserves a lot of the credit for the book all I did was sit there and fume and fulminate against the state of the world after breakfast every day. And he knitted it together into work. There are a lot of layers to that because I know that you'd mentioned that it's as if the, the economic system is sort of enshrouded in its own language. Um, <laughs> it's like the, it's sort of a nonsense language. And they still did things in Latin. Yes, not that Latin is nonsense, but yeah. No, but it's, it's when you use it now, for the purpose of making sure that you can condescend to the people who don't understand Latin. And that's basically mm-hmm. what economists do. They say, you don't speak economics, do you? No. Well, why don't you run along then? Keeps, keeps things in their bubble. And, well, mind you, there's a, there's a bit of a pun there. <laughs> um, <laughs> keeps people out from, just from understanding the very kind of simple, I guess it's quite a simple machine. Finance is a simple machine. You know, a banker friend of mine said, look, in the end, it's money in and money out. Everything else is bullshit. Um, And they dress it up in all kinds of language. And all you need to do is explain it to people in ordinary language. And after about, I don't know, a minute and 45 seconds, they go, oh, is that what that is? You say, that's all it is. Yeah, but heaven forbid people understand. I mean, if they they understand, then there's (laughs) there's no measure of control. And, and No, No, and people get very angry. I did talks up and down the country when we published the book. We basically used the proceeds from the book to fund a speaking tour up and down the country so that we could then sell more books and do more talks. It was just an exercise in getting out this other narrative. And what was interesting in those talks and the subsequent year and a half of talks I did about the big trade agreement, you know, the TTIP and the, um, all those big trade agreements, is it was it almost always followed the same pattern. I start talking and about... Somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour in, because, you know, the proper long talks, public talks, somebody, usually someone over 60, and very often over 60 wearing, you know, almost twin set and pearls, you know, <coughs> one of the pillars of the community, they would use the R word. I never did. They used it. They would start saying, we need a revolution. And, and, and these were people who probably voted Tory or at best Lib Dem. None of them were wearing Che Guevara t-shirts and had very gentle. <laughs> um, and so you realise there was a deep, at least you could say unease, if not a deep brewing anger in very ordinary mid, you know, middle of the road people. They had the sense that they were being hoodwinked. And when you explain it to them and they can see just the depths of the condescension, they get really angry. I mean, how are banks supposed to regulate themselves if everyone understands what they're doing? They never get get away with it. It's not happening. (laughs) Yes. Um, It's like the money laundering, the laws for money laundering. 
the laws for money laundering say if you're a bank that suspects you're money laundering you need to report that there you if go. you're a, if you're, a, if you're a bank robber and uh, if you're if you're break if you suspect that you might be breaking into someone's uh, someone's house to steal their jewels you need to tell us Whew, i'm glad you told me which is why nobody ever goes to jail for money laundering yeah it's it's quite it's quite warped i I'm not going to launch into a conversation about about neoliberal economic philosophy because that's going to be a separate podcast. But I'm going to, and I hope so far the timeline's right because if you will, I'm going to gloss straight over your political career. Although I'm sure, mm-hmm. I'm sure, I'm sure listeners would enjoy imagining a more age-appropriate Christopher Walken, like from the Deer Hunter, 1973, campaigning yes. for the Green Party in his finest British accent. And I know the experience. <laughs> I know the experience wasn't as pleasant for you. So, so we'll just skip over that to the part we're walking. There's current David Malone making a documentary on AI and consciousness. So, how did that happen? Um, like most um, good things in my life, it fell in my lap. Um, I am probably one of the luckiest people alive. I just have good luck um, in most of my life. A very old colleague of mine. Um, you know, from sort of 25 years ago, phoned up out of the blue, said she'd been asked to direct something on AI. But she's very much a people director. You know, she makes people feature films. And said, I really don't feel up to doing all the interviews. Would you mind awfully doing the interviews for us? So I thought to myself, so wait a minute, you're going to pay me to fly me around the world to have conversations with 40 really interesting people I'd like to meet. And afterwards, I don't even have to make it make sense in the country room. You're going to do that. <gasps> wow, difficult decision. <laughs> so that's what happened. And, you know, um, feature films are, they, they stay in much better hotels than television people, let me tell you. And, and you often fly business class. I never... Business class to me was just that section of the aircraft that I saw out of my left eye as I was instructed to turn right and carry on to the back of the plane. It's amazing. I just suddenly can't get out of my head seeing Christopher Walken play that scene. <laughs> but but I, I can also see, I can see young, that young Christopher Walken chatting to, to the techie boys who control the narrative and currently decide the future on behalf of AI and behalf of everyone else. When I say techie boys, that's quote unquote. It's slightly frightening. Yeah. They don't realize, like a lot of scientists and technologists, not all, but a lot, they, they don't believe that there is a narrative. They often don't think that they have metaphors and they, they don't think that they really have assumptions. They think we've got facts, we've got data. And because they believe, you know, you may have um, beliefs that distort your worldview, but I, as a scientist, just see the objective truth. And because they believe that, they are totally blind to their shared narrative of the world. If they were at least aware of it, you could have a discussion with them about it and say, do you really think that's a good idea? But you can't. As I said, but with a lot of them, and especially a lot of the sort of very entitled tech billionaires and the people who ride on their coattails, they're a worryingly homogenous lot. Yeah, my, my concern with that is how many people look up to them unquestioningly and follow them blindly. And, and anything they say or do with their opinions, it's, it's never questioned because they are who they are. Yeah, it was the general at the back who said, front rank, advance. And most of the front rank <laughs> never come back. Another tragically profound comment, yes. If we look at what you're saying in context to information, where, for example, and, and, and things being misconstrued or, or not seen in the right context, where DNA is a code. And when you understand AI coding, you realize it's a program. You could go as far as arguing that we're also programs. And the, you know, the word is not structured in form for nothing. And you, you speak about matter, energy, and information. And you'd said ideas push electrons around. And then you discuss <laughs> it in relation to dualism. And, and I'm just thinking, Based on who's driving the AI narrative, the question then is what ideas are pushing this narrative around? And then, you know, we can clearly see what is being informed by it as a, a runaway train. Yeah, well, I mean, my concern is that they have a conception of what 
the human mind is and expanded from that what being human is, which from my view is at the very least very narrow. You, some people might say it's just wrong, but I, I feel like, don't feel I need to go that far. It's just very narrow. They have a very, well, they think that all human thought is, is based on binary logic, which it has to be. It, from their view, if they think they're going to create intelligence, never mind superintelligence, on the basis of a binary logic machine, which is a huge assumption, but one which they so obvious that they would refuse to see it as an assumption. That it's always the assumptions that are so obvious they're the, they're the dangerous ones. Um, um, you know, there was a time when it was so obvious that black people weren't really human that you just didn't really have to discuss it. You know. Um, is when people have assumptions that they think are so obvious that there's no reason to possibly question them. And their view of building intelligence is a very narrow one. So my worry is that they'll succeed. And what they'll end up with is um, digital psychopaths. I think one of the companies or entities you spoke to has um, a project in a prison system. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a famous one uh, where they decided to let the AI, to program an AI to evaluate um, who should get parole and who shouldn't. And the basis of this, the, the reason why people said this is good, is, you know, sounds so right on when they say it. Well, you know, human beings, judges, they're, they're full of, of prejudice. So what we'll do is we'll program an AI and it'll, it, it won't have this prejudice because it'll be an AI, right? And also, we are programming us, wonderful people who must be very clever, must be the best people in the room because we're so rich, obviously. Yeah. Um, and what they didn't realize is basically they fed their AI all the data of human prejudice and the AI turned out to be extremely prejudiced. And um, certain groups were being given parole far less than any others by the AI. So at the very least, you'd say absolutely nothing had been improved. And in fact, it was a lot worse because the judge, people are used to the idea that you could say to a judge, you know what, you're a bit of a prejudiced old git, and I can see that, so I'm going to object. Whereas everyone goes, it's an AI. Ooh, it's technology. It must be right. And you can't actually question it. You can't say, I think your AI is is wrong it's it's embedded in it is all sorts of prejudice because they'll say well you can't prove that and they'll say well well i can if you let me look inside it and they'll say well you can't because that's commercially confidential <laughs> yeah so yeah. that's not good but i mean it sort of it gets worse because if the narrative the global media narrative the current one doesn't represent diverse interests if enough people aren't talking about the future of ai social and human rights injustices is just going to be exacerbated and i mean you speak about the racial bias in data programming and not only is the blame going to be shifted oh it wasn't us as a machine precisely but, but you see the, the, the argument's very seductive they and and, and the, the test case interestingly is is the self-driving car because they'll say do you know how many people are killed on our streets by bad drivers drunk drivers not paying attention drivers short sighted to drivers, drivers who are anxious, thinking about other things, hundreds of thousands. Once we have AI driving our cars, none of that will happen. And so you go, wow, ooh, that sounds great, yeah. All right, let's leave to one side the fact that we're nowhere near this. But you, if, once you accept that notion, then everything can be patterned on it. That, well, all of these things that are human failings, if we just replace it with AI, it'll be better. Because you sort of refer back to the car and you just generalize from that. But it's, you know, we, we know from the, the example of the prison system one we just talked about, that it, it doesn't work that way. And it also means that you're enshrining in the systems that you're increasingly saying to people, these will be the systems that make decisions for you. They will make decisions about what's going to be done to you that they're systems that are, well, A, they're shrouded in, in secrecy, B, you can't object to them, and C, they are an, in, they're an example of a very, very narrow utilitarian view of what it is to be human. And um, that leaves out most of what's good in being a human.
It's like the Netflix series, The Good Place. I don't know if you watched that. No, no, no. Um, um, I, I don't stream the same way as I, I don't drink polluted water. <laughs> the Good Place is interesting because it explores the ethical and moral dilemmas that we as humans are still grappling with in this context. And in this series, they actually use the trolley problem. Oh, you know, the radio trolley. trolley. Yeah, oh, I wish. I, I think what would do the world good is if, if it would hit the headlines. Shock horror. Prominent philosopher run over by trolley today. Then it would start to be a bit, a bit real for them because they're such bollocks. It's true. It they, is no, true. They say, Imagine the situation. So there's a trolley careering down the road, <laughs> and uh, in front of it, there's a there's a group of there's a fat man, and uh, it's. It, it, but if you avoid the fat man, you might hit these three children. What do you do? And they want you to accept that that description of reality is reality. And that only the information they've given you in their godlike, I'm a philosopher way, that you have to accept that that's the sum total of the information that A, you can have, and B, that's relevant. Well, how about, do I know that the fat man will be killed if it, if it hits him? Do I think to myself, do you know, I think I've seen that bloke before, and I saw him beating his child. So fuck him. I'm fine with that. Um, or, you know... This, this, basically, they construct a problem which leaves out about 80% of the considerations which a flesh and blood human would have in their mind. And the trick is that they get you to accept on their authority that this is the sum total of the information that you ought to use. And it's not. There's a thousand other details that you would use. And the only person who would restrict themselves to the data in their trolley problem is a psychopath. And that's the world they're trying to build for you to live in. Precisely. And if we're struggling with that as humans, how can we program, what did you say? They said nice values. When we oh, as humans, yes. we... <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. When we, when we asked them, they said, you know, don't worry we're good, we're, about the self-driving car. Well, but, but, but what kind of moral values will you... Should, it'll have to make moral decisions, won't it? And with, same with weapons. I was talking to them about weapons and, you know, weapons that do killing all, on their own, which there are, um, although they claim there aren't. And, and so, well, what, 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 whose values? Because obviously, you know, if um, ISIS created a killer drone, I think that they would probably put in values, moral values, and I think they might be slightly different to the average Americans. So whose values? And the answer from this highly paid philosopher was, don't worry, we're putting nice values. And I thought, wow, this person's on tenure to tell me that? <laughs> I can't believe they actually used the word nice. I mean, we're still struggling yeah, between nice. utilitarian and, and deontological ethical approaches. And, and they're saying nice values. You know, if Aristotle were alive, I think he'd throw himself off a bridge. He'd, he'd just stand in front of the trolley, <laughs> throw himself in front of the trolley, and say, "It's, it's no good. It's no good." <laughs> Plato, you wouldn't have to worry about. You'd be hiding in a cave. <laughs> so, I mean, but but the whole thing—it just goes to show how little we know about even our own technology, our minds, our brains. Our hearts. I mean, what is it that drives us to make these decisions? How we are programmed in what programs our decisions. I mean... It's okay not to know, and it's okay to say to yourself, my knowledge is really provisional. But what, what, what you can't help noticing is that every generation has a metaphor for what the mind is, and it's nearly always based on whatever the latest technology is that they're really, really taken with. So, you know, at some point, people had versions of the mind you know, and the heart, which were all to do with sort of hydraulics because we just harnessed water power. Yay, that was, we were so impressed with ourselves with this technology. And then later we discover electricity. So now it's all electrical. And then we invent the computer and suddenly the mind is a computer. What do you know? <laughs> There's the irony that, that the heart has neurons of its own and a mind of its yeah, own. Small it has mind a of its huge own. number of neurons. And then neurons, that's the other thing, because I specifically asked, you know, the, the scientists... I was chatting to her about this. I said, hang on, are they just nerve cells? And he said, no, they're not. They're neurons. They're physiologically the same as the ones in your head. So if you're saying that neurons in your head 
being wired together are what allow you to be conscious, then what is your argument to say the exact same cells wired together in exactly the same way are not thinking in your heart or in your gut? What is your argument? I don't have an, I can't prove that they are, but I don't need to. I'm not the one laying down the law here. There's no thinking going on. Well, okay, give us your argument then. Because neurons in the head, apparently they think, and if they find themselves in the heart, they can't. How's that work? And I mean, I, I know I come across as sort of um, slightly sort of sniping from the sidelines. And I am at the people who I think are falling short on their moral duty as intellectuals. Because there is a moral duty to being a professor or a teacher. Um, and there's a definite moral duty on scientists and technologists. And lots of them object to that. But I'm sorry, that's just how I see it. And the best of them accept that. And they are Roger Penrose or Ian McGilchrist or you know, George Steiner, people who I hugely admire or Greg Chaitin, a mathematician, they, they have a kind of intellectual humility about them. You know, they might be arrogant as people, some of them, but intellectually, they, there's a sort of humility about the limits of what they can say and what they're sure of, and a moral concern, at least, that what people might take from what they're saying, and they're careful about it, in a way that I think, Richard won't like me for this, but Richard doesn't like me anyway. In, you know, I, I always felt Richard Dawkins didn't, was happy. Well, he was at least complicit with allowing all kinds of people to make off, with, you make use of what he said, always perturbed me. Anyway, sorry, I digress. No, 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 not, not at all. I mean, I, actually, I'm glad that you brought up Ian because I was hoping that you could talk a little to to what it is he does and, and his perspective, because it's, it's quite profound. Oh, Ian, yes. yes. You know he's writing a new book. A new one? Yeah. No? Yes. His magnum opus, I think. Yeah? At the moment, it's about 32 enormous chapters. I've read two of them, and they're brilliant. Um, yeah, it's, um, I think it will be more challenging to the status quo and then the master and his emissary. Now, Ian, Ian is an example of someone I greatly admire as a lecturer. So, so can you just, for, for the listeners who aren't familiar with him or what it is that his philosophy is, just give us an idea. Sure. Um, well, Ian McGilchrist, uh, I suppose people these days would call him a philosopher. He, he was a consultant psychiatrist at the Maudsley, which is sort of Britain's leading um, psychiatric hospital. Um, he graduated from Oxford um, in English, in fact, and then trained as a doctor and then trained as a psychiatrist. Um, and then wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary. Basically, that was the summation of f at least 14 years of his adult life. And he um, wanted to understand how the mind works. And specifically, he felt that, at least in the West, we were losing the ability to grasp uh, life and our thoughts in the round and we're sort of dis we'd walled ourselves off behind a sort of a transparent wall of rationality and logic and so when, when you know from his point of view when you when you, people read a book they they didn't read the whole book they read it as grist for whatever theoretical mill they were um, enslaved to so you know marxists would read it as a uh, as grist for the marxist mill or feminist for the feminist mill or deconstructionist for the deconstruction mill have interesting things to say but it would be like going into a rose garden and um just measuring the color of the leaves and the color very of the reductionist <laughs> it made some measurements of the chemicals and never actually smelling a rose and so he, he wrote this book, and in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, I think when people come to write the history of thinking about the mind, they'll go Freud, Jung, McGilchrist, and in between there'll be other, other runners. Well, that's how I think it'll go. I think it's an extremely profound book, and it, it, it's profound and its importance isn't based on how whether it's right 
its importance is it um, the the fecundity the, fer the fertility of his thoughts it he he creates a a great garden of possibilities and links and it means that it will be the basis for lots of other thinking some of which will eclipse what he's written and prove that it was wrong but they'll get there by that um, yes yeah it's like it's like the history of the physicists it's the same thing you see the one builds on the other you know they wouldn't yeah. be able to do anything without that form of building block yes yeah and i and i think it's a it's a terribly profound book so and now he's writing another <laughs> It's amazing. I, I watched a, a talk of his and one of the things I came across quite profoundly was he, he was speaking of when someone is paralyzed on the right side of the body, then is paralyzed after a stroke. And then they'd yeah. be in the hospital bed and he'd say to them, okay, lift your hand. And they'd say, yeah, I'm lifting it. And he said, no, lift your hand. And then he'd explain to them that they're not lifting it by physically showing them and picking yeah. it up and putting it on them. And then they say, no, it's not, it's not my hand. And, and his, his point was, if I remember correctly, is he was talking about the disjoint between what happens when you shut off uh, the right side of the brain in the, the, the decision-making process between both sides. And, and the logical, rational brain, just it begins to completely embarrass itself entirely. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that goes back to Sperry back in the 70s. And a lot of it became discredited because um you know people used it to sort of advance all kinds of hippy dippy notions um and then the underlying science got discredited but what McGilchrist does is he he says look the division physiologically in the brain is clear um it's been a division which is goes back um hundreds and hundreds of millions possibly billions of years certainly hundreds of millions of years in in the evolution so it's a very ancient division and you can see that the two sides of the mind look at the world differently and they have you know you we all sort of say well i've got you know this is my 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 intellectual habit my habit of mind is this his point is that within it for all of us there are two different habits of mind and it's clearest it's clearest when he you know you he looks at birds for instance you know he said look one side of the mind has to focus on bits bits of the world it just sees bits of the world and it's its interest is in discriminating this little tiny bit of the world and that little, tiny little bit of the world because it has to get the bird to eat grains of grass and not grains of sand so that's its interest and that's what it focuses on little isolated bits of the world what is this what is that how does that bit work how does that bit work it's not interested in the big picture and it's good that it's not because if it if it was distracted, then lots of birds would eat lots of sand and die. But if you're a bird concentrating on eating, just trying to decide is that sand or is that a grain of grass, some bigger bird is going to come on and have you for lunch. So you need a completely separate side of your mind whose job it is to be constantly looking around going, ooh, what's that over there? Gosh, I wonder what that is. Ooh, look at that. That's fantastic. Wow, what a big plate I'm in. And you can't have the same bit of the mind doing both because they're completely opposed. And he said, you see that, exactly that very clearly in the left and right brain. And creatures like us, we still have those two brains and they're still doing, seeing the world in different ways. But now it is retasked in all the complications of human life. But the basic division is still there. Now that's a brilliant and in some sense indisputable insight. And then he creates a wonderful tapestry of possibility from that yes it's a pretty we've we've ended up sort of infusing the past centuries of thinking based on just that one side of the brain instead of both yes yeah i mean the, the psychology behind that sort of results in things that are quite concerning like if you look at the matrix movie which is brilliant but the world hmm. that the wachowskis create have neo trinity and morpheus return to a pond leaving the simulation is extremely dystopian and then you get extremely the opposite world where james cameron creates in a sense an avatar where the consciousness is transferred into beings who have the utopian natural habitat invaded by the military industrial complex mm. you know, yeah, yeah. i mean by no means does this excuse james cameron for terminator but on, on the topic of transferring consciousness, the consciousness part of, of the conversation, um, Black Mirror kind of deals a lot with these, like you say, that the old white men are afraid of dying, so they put their consciousness, they're finding ways to put their consciousness in place. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's 
it, it, it's not really surprising, is it? Very old, very rich techno files suddenly become interested in the possibility of uploading their brains so they can live forever. Hmm, who would have guessed? You see, now this, this brings up something, something interesting because one of the things that one of the problems resulting from a, a populist lack of understanding in terms of who writes the future of AI, and, and I'm circling back to that for a reason, is, is it's the element of existential morality, and, and, that's, and you touch on that the world that our children grow up in, when you can just do whatever it is that you want to, to an AI. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, this and then this it, I talk to them all about, because it bothers me. It hugely bothers me. Um, because it's it, it's something that people don't think about because the perspective that we are given and is the one that we understand and that's the one that whether we think about it or not Hollywood might kind of have a, a bit of a well mind you not entirely Hollywood but it's the reverse of Asimov's three laws of robotics so and they appear in a theme throughout iRobot which is with Will Smith but they have they have a larger influence on, on later science fiction the impact and thought on ethics of AI I mean the first law is a robot may not injure a human being through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. The second law is a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders conflict with the first law. And then the third law is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection doesn't conflict with the first or second laws. And these are the perspectives, but the perspective shifts when you know, with what you said with the children is that you're looking at it, it from another angle altogether and yeah well i mean that that, that you no know, it's what do people want what is it that the, of the ultimate goal is when they've got their self-driving car what is it they want what is it that we see in films and you know the the hollywood version of of irobot showed it to you you know humanistic looking robot strolling around saying you know, I was just doing the washing up and then I was going to make a cake and um, is there anything you want me to get, you know, at the shops? I'll run out and get it. When I come back, I'll do the hoovering. Well, you know, on the one hand, you go, well, that's great. I mean, that's basically your dice, you know, your hoover, your washing machine, your fridge, all doing what they need to do to make your life fabulous. And when you think about it in those terms, you just think, well, they're, they're just better gadgets. Okay, seen from that side, that's what it is. It's not that you've harmed the robot because it's easy to say look you know you don't have to feel bad if you lose your temper and kick your washing machine it's a hunk of metal and that may be true maybe we're going to make robots that seem human but there's it's just like will smith it's, it's just clockwork and flashing lights there's nobody in you don't no one feels bad morally bad if their car runs out of petrol your, your car hasn't died of thirst it's just empty you know when the little red light goes on and says you really must fill it up, it's not your child going, Daddy, I'm so thirsty, please give me something to drink. It's just a car. Let's imagine that that's what we make. But if those robots look human, and we will make them human because there's an entire industry working night and day to make them look human and sound human and even feel human, your children are going to grow up in a world where there's a whole class of things which look like human beings that they can treat as slaves. What's, it's not the harm that we're going to do to these machines that worries me. It's the harm we'll do to ourselves. You know, the, where, it, where I see that, Hollywood's, the way that Hollywood kind of inculcates humans to think about AI is, it's just shocking. But what's interesting, and, and it's quite rare that you'd see this from the current series Westworld perspective, this is this. It gives the opposite of this. These Asimov's laws is from from the actual AI's perspective, and it goes way beyond the concept of uncanny valley. But there's that feeling as a human where you know you are engaging with something that's not human. Mm -hmm. That's Sophia the robot. Something. It just even if it looks extremely human, or maybe if I if I grew up watching the walking dead and i associated ai with zombies the way i think about them would be very different but in 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 the westworld series and i'm not quite sure because i didn't see the first one i know you did is the rich just go to various parks where the ais are programmed to entertain them under the most abusive circumstances so it's the worst sure. of humanity through the ages and I'm, I'm doing a bit of a spoiler here because they only they only introduce the last 
two of the uh, of the of the parks that I'm going to mention now in the third season. So uh, it's just a matter of skipping a few seconds ahead. But there's Roman medieval, the West Shogun world, War World, which is Nazi Germany. And I mean, you could only imagine bored, rich, immoral humans being the bad guys in this, going in there and just playing games and you know, shooting up people and raping and pillaging in these different contexts. And the AI is a program with narratives, which they then respond to. And some of them start realizing what is going on. And then it becomes very different because the, it, Westworld suddenly offers a context for these, these beings to become conscious, to questioning the nature of the, the reality. Then they rewrite the narratives to back their own story. And I mean, it's again, it's quite in line with the post-human philosophy, but they, they don't judge who's more or less based on race, gender, disability. And I mean, yeah, trust, I guess, Christopher Nolan, who created Inception's brother, it's Jonathan Nolan, to use Westworld's AI angle to explore consciousness and self and free will. But I don't know what, what the first one was like, uh, the, the initial Westworld. Oh, it, it, it was just the basic, you know, um, it was the, the same premise, you know, your runner is a, is a, is a cowboy robot, but um, um, so, you know, you get to go in there and pretend that you're Billy the Kid and, you, you know, you can draw your weapon faster than anyone else and play out some sort of pure art fantasy, but unfortunately the robots go, hang on a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then it all goes sadly wrong. You know, I think, I think talking to a lot of the people in AI, one big group felt, they said, look, these dystopian worries, they're so far off. Why are you even worrying about it? And, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the dystopian warriors, they sort of went along with that. Yes, you know, when we have super AI, I actually think the real problems for us are going to be upon us long before we make you know, super advanced AI that looks human, feels human, thinks like humans. It's going to be almost mm -hmm. upon us now. Because, you know, if, if AIs, if we say, well, AIs could teach far more cheap than training all these, having all these teachers, you know, we could have AIs that would, we could half the class size, and it sounds all great, half the class size, an AI would never, you know, never have a bad day, never come into class hungover, never, never take against the child, they'll always be very understanding, they'll, you know, they've got the bandwidth and the memory to, to be slightly different for every child. It sounds great. In fact, why wouldn't you want that? But will humans, what would be the point of humans going to university and knowing the stuff themselves? Why would, it, why would we as a society pay for that? Because they're not going to get a job as a teacher. There's an AI doing that. So you can very easily foresee a situation where your children are taught wonderfully. But there's less and less reason for them ever to bother to be taught. What are they going to do with all that information? And that's the problem. I mean, my favorite science fiction story is one of the first science fiction stories ever written by Ian Forster, who only ever wrote one science fiction story, and it's called Machine Stops. And it's the most prescient science fiction story ever written. And it was published in 1905, I think it is. And he imagines in that book the World Wide Web. In 1905, starts out saying, imagine a small cubicle, a little white place, and there's a, there's a pearlescent screen, and a, a rather pasty, flabby lady is talking to her best friends from all over the world via the screen, and everything that she needs is delivered to her. And all that happens in this short story is humanity, the, the uh, only thing they can say, oh my God, we must save machine. We, we've got to resurrect machine. We must save machine translate that and to we must bail out the banks we must uh, save the financial situation we must and so they don't bother saving themselves they never think to get out of their room which is now on fire and they're starving to death and climb out of the machine they humanity had built a machine and the last person closed the last hatch behind him or her and forgot there was an outside that is us because if you're looking at ai for everyone Everyone can't go, oh, what's AI for everyone if they don't know what it is or what exists because they think it's just a robot and there isn't enough information. Yeah, I mean, if we're looking at shifting from problems 
with, for example, encouraging investment in creating things that can be slaves uh, mm. or think for themselves versus how AI can change the way we understand ecosystems management, for example, agent-based mm. modeling. And then what techniques scientists, they, the, as the technique scientists use to model, model complex natural systems, and then deep learning. And there's a big difference between bottom-up and top-down AI. And if we're needing to sort through big data, for example, to make important decisions, there are things like Bayesian networks, which can factor in unpredictability. And I mean, the potential to really address systemic key world problems and get quantitative data from sources that the dominant narrative doesn't represent. I mean, perhaps we would all, can I venture to say, maybe even be prepared for current times? I mean, because the masses' potential intelligence is insulted because we constantly deemed ethically, emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually lazy. All we want to do is have AI serve our questionable morals, but that's not the case. No, I mean, what's going to kill humanity um, is going to be, we're going to choke to death on convenience. The consumer culture prevailed. Well, yeah, people will accept everything. You know. Can I have all your data because it'll be more convenient? I'll be able to tell what you want. Ooh, okay. And then it's not telling you. It's not finding out what you want. It's shepherding you. Yes. You know, the, the, the sheep dog doesn't ask the sheep, having got to know the sheep really well, where the sheep would like to go. The sheep dog already knows where it wants the sheep to go. And the sheep have seceded to the sheep dog being in charge. And it's very convenient. <laughs> yeah, it's called and advanced uh, capitalism and surveillance capitalism. Yes, it is. It is surveillance capitalism. And, you know, I've talked to people about who worked at Facebook. It is not a benign technology. Mm -hmm. It is not. The reason that a, a major part, a large part of the reason in the, the um, hooked up electronic West that people are falling out with each other is because the algorithm, it, it feeds you what will keep you paying attention. So if there is an article that makes you annoyed and you hammer out the keyboard, some angry message, the AI says, send them more of that. And so what we've seen in, you know, in the famous contested elections, you know, Brexit and Trump, is that each side is sent by the algorithms um, a mixture of the things which people just like them are saying and the things that people just like them are angry about and the things that make them angry, which is basically the worst examples of what they imagine the enemy, the people that they disagree with, are like. Not the best examples, not the reasonable examples, but the ones that are going to make them really angry and stay on the keyboard. And that's what happens to both sides. And so you end up with what we have, which is everyone hating everybody else. And people aren't worse now than they were when my grandfather was alive. They're not m worse people. In many ways, they're better people but we are angrier with each other. And Facebook, the algorithm of Facebook, has a large part to play in that, according to some of the people I spoke to who worked on that algorithm. So, but it's convenient. <laughs> convenient that the West has got such a low emotional EQ and it's super easily angry about very first world problems. Yeah, very convenient. Yeah. So you see, I mean, all is not lost. I mean, thing, things will get better, but it will get rough for a while. Mm. <laughs> yes. So you're saying that to the listeners is, is Morpheus is offering you the red pull. That's where we talk about the unpleasant truth and together do something about it. We'll take the blue pull and remain just blissfully ignorant and risk devolving and blaming the AI. Yes. Yeah, and just just you, yeah. you can you yeah. can get your TV dinner by Uber. Yeah, you know, but but that you know the option to take the red pill is being dangerously sort of you know not encouraged. No, so no, definitely not encouraged. People are um, making documentaries about it, <laughs> <laughs> amongst other things. People have an unreasonable streak in them, and actually, I personally believe that it is the unreasonableness of people 
which is what saves us in the end. Often the path is rocky, but when all else has failed, people just pig-headed unreasonableness is often just the rock in the road which upsets the caravan. Unreasonable. Such an interesting term to use. Hmm. Yes. I mean, my, my mother said this. My mother was very political. And she, she, she said, in the end, the, the, the reason that um, England will be all right, she said, most Englishmen are basically, at heart, hooligans. Some of them have been semi-civilised. But at heart, there's a hooligan inside every Englishman just waiting to get that out. And she said, ultimately, that's what will stop um, England being completely submerged under some kind of, you know, unpleasant order. You She's say, the best uncomfortable hooligan. Yeah, it's unreasonable that, you know, not reasoning that the, the not only left brain Ian McGilchrist, you know, talking about the logic that just isolated logic. Yeah. Yeah, because when people say, but, you know, it makes no sense that you voted for this. It makes no sense that you're choosing to do that. You'd be so much better off doing something else. And, that, and, and they may be right about that, but I take some solace in the fact that in the face of that entirely rational argument, some people just go, you know what? Sod it. Yeah. Speaking of consciousness, I'm quite conscious of our time. I'm just so curious to ask you, because you, you're quite ambivalent about the pop culture angle on this. And I just wonder how you explain your email address. Um, well, you know, it's, the, it's the Stanislaw Lem, one of the greatest science fiction authors and probably the greatest philosopher of the mind who's ever lived. I mean, and he wrote lots of scientific science fiction stories where he's he's trying short stories trying to get at what's the difference between a mechanism and something that's intelligence what's the difference between intelligence and consciousness or self-awareness wonderful wonderful stories and in one of them he he imagines it's it's written as as a fake report to the american military um and they've been trying to build a fully conscious super intelligent machine to help them wage war and they've called each one a golem as in you know the the jewish um, mystical belief about being able to create a little creature out of clay which can be brought to life yeah. um, and they create 13 of them and they all go wrong they just don't work and then the 14th one golem 14 it works and they have a super intelligent conscious supercomputer and they go yay and then basically, to cut a long story short, the computer, instead of helping them, looks at them and says, hang on a second, what makes you think, you odiferous, smelly, hairy, pimply, greasy monkeys who've only just stopped picking the nits off each other's asses? I want to help you kill each other. On the wrong. That's a good question. When did you say this book was written? That one, I think it would have been written in the 80s, but he wrote such a lot. Stanislaw Lem, just brilliant. Um, I think probably the, one of the most wonderful stories, I think it's called The Mask. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to tell you anything about it because that would give it away, but it's a profound short story about, about artificial intelligences and emotion and the difference between programming and something you might call free will. Well, there you have it. Well, we have to talk about AI will be on Universal. You can find many of David's documentaries, such as The Secret Life of Waves, Heart vs. Mind, and Dangerous Knowledge on YouTube. We may as well use our free will for good, since it seems like it's up to us to collectively avert the unprecedented ignorance of the potential of AI. The next episode will leave you wishing Hollywood screenwriters consulted with real, actual AI experts, like artificial intelligence innovator Alex Sado. I guarantee he will sate your curiosity about how we can use AI for sustainable social systems impact. Thank you for listening. 
This is Janique Randall.